Good morning, everyone. It is January 28th, 2022. My name is Carl Hawkinson. I'm with the University of Minnesota Extension, Hennepin County, and I spend my time working on uh, emerging agricultural issues, uh, local foods, that sort of thing, and then also natural resources. And uh, I'm going to do a few little introductions here and then uh, and uh, learn about what's going on at the University of Minnesota Extension, agrovoltaics, solar farms, and dairy, on dairy farms, solar energy on dairy farms with Brad Hines doing some great work. I'm really looking forward to hearing about it. Um, so we got a few people here. Maybe we won't do introductions for everybody, but if you could maybe just post your name and affiliation or, uh, or where you're coming from, uh, that would be great. Um, so I work with, uh, uh, the Sustainable Farming Association on this Ecological Service Livestock Network. Uh, and I also host uh, and run the Twin Cities Metro Growers Network. And I was drawn to Sustainable Farming Association because they're all about networking. And uh, back in the 90s, when I was in Wisconsin, we started the grazing networks. And it's just a great way to bring people together and uh, and to share and to learn together and uh, do it um, in place. Uh, usually we go to where people are at, but with lovely COVID and 20 below, it's not so bad hanging out in your, in your living room. But um, the main idea is informal, but very informative learning. And uh, with the Service Livestock Network, we, we didn't really do much last year with Mr. COVID in town, but uh, We've been working a lot with the businesses that have goats, and uh, they're working with county, excuse me, county governments and uh, private landowners and many others to get a handle on our uh, degraded uh, sit landscapes, I'll call them, uh, choked with buckthorn and other invasive species. And, uh, and what we like to say uh, that, uh, is we're returning livestock to the land, uh, we're mimicking nature, and, uh, and these landscapes around the metro and, and a lot of around the Midwest, uh, we recognize as graze obligate landscapes. That is to say, they evolved with animals by the multitude munching and eating their way across the landscape. And, and, and we see that now as we've taken them away, uh, we've got some real ecological problems out there. So in another vein, then, um, with the climate catastrophe upon us and getting away from fossil fuels, uh, solar panels are one of the premier ways, ways that we're gonna do that. Um, and uh, covering up the landscape with solar panels um, has some challenges and some problems. As we like to say, it's, uh, it's not the what, it's the how. And uh, we started an informal group of, uh, we call it solar plus habitat, plus livestock, can we do solar panels uh, in a way that um, increases overall net productivity and not just focuses on one thing? Um, so can we have habitat under and with our solar panels? Can we graze animals there? And can we have multiple benefits that uh, uh, is a win, win, win? And, uh, and I think we can say yes. And so, uh, yeah, again, if you could just post uh, in the chat, your name and where you're coming from. And uh, that's my little chat. And so we're pretty informal here, but I'm gonna turn it over to Brad Hines. He's with the University of Minnesota at the uh, West Central Research and Outreach Center in Morris. And he runs the organic dairy herd there. And uh, they are researching agrivoltaics. Uh, you know, uh, everybody says, well, you can do sheep under solar panels, but you can't do goats, you can't do cattle. Well. I'm uh, not sure about that. And I think Brad might have something to say about that. So um, without further ado, Brad, I'm gonna turn it over to you. And uh, if you could do the introductions of, of yourself and your program, and then uh, we'll take it from there. Okay, thanks, Carl. Uh, appreciate uh, the chance to uh, present a little bit about what we're doing out here uh, in Morris, uh, a little bit about myself. I'm an associate <clears throat> professor of animal science and um, located at West Central Research and Outreach Center in Morris, Minnesota. So way along the South Dakota border. And uh, gonna talk a little bit about 
give an overview about a little bit about the dairy program here and then kind of our journey into renewable energy and into agrivoltaics and really how we got there. And then a little bit of the early research uh, that we've done with solar grazing and then kind of next steps and where we're going from here. Um, and we'll talk a little bit about um, my graduate student Kirsten Sharp's uh, research and uh, we've been working with uh, Eric Buchanan as well. He's a scientist, renewable energy scientist out here at Morris and Mike Reese is the a renewable energy director that works in a lot of uh, programs uh, as uh, despite uh, cows and solar too. Lots more things happening out here. So a little bit about uh, our uh, research center. So we obviously we got cows out here. It's a pasture based and a kind of confinement dairy. Um, you can see our, our research center here on the left and you'll notice some solar uh, happenings popping up all over the place and we'll describe some of those. Uh, as we go and and why we did what we did and and uh, what what we all have actually so it's um, it's uh, great to do it on uh, pictures on a webinar but if you ever get the chance and want to come to western Minnesota wherever you may be in the U.S. feel free to come out and we will show you everything and uh, uh, open our place up so you can kind of get a, a good picture obviously pictures uh uh, work, but seeing is believing. I'm hearing a, uh, a field day this summer, perhaps. Yes, possibly, definitely. Uh, so a little more about our, our research center. So you notice two big uh, wind turbines here, and that's where it really started. The renewable energy focus started well, long before I got here, uh, maybe 2005 or something like that uh, is really where we started with uh, renewable energy. and we've started to move into the solar across the time. A background, obviously lots of uh, solar, uh, lots of pasture here for our, our dairy program. Uh, we have uh, solar installations from on, on the east side, on the west side, uh, kind of all over the place, but kind of to get a, a picture of the landscape of our research center, um, on the western pasture side, you'll notice that's the University of Minnesota Morris, so a, a, liberal, a liberal arts college uh, that <clears throat> really has some sustainability goals as well. And we've been partnering with them, and we'll talk about they have some solar installations that that are in our pasture too. So it's been a good partnership uh, with them uh, throughout uh, this time period. Kind of what I talked about, we have kind of two dairy herds here. Uh, we have an organic herd. Obviously, we do a lot of grazing. In the winter time, they're kind of outdoors, and we also have a low input conventional herd, kind of the same thing. So we're about 300 milking cows here on our dairy, so maybe a, a little bit larger than typical Minnesota-sized dairies, but that's kind of uh, where, where we sit today. <clears throat> but really, our we have a, a goal here at our research center is really to green energy consumed in ag production systems. And that can be through wind, through solar, through, uh, you know, we're, we're generating, we have a, a wind to ammonia plant, uh, lots of different things here, but that's kind of our goal is to really sort of green our energy production. With some of our solar goals, and I'll talk a little bit about this into the future uh, and, and describe a little bit more, but our goal was to actually uh, have solar and utilize cows. Uh, you know, at, at one point, a lot of people thought about sheep. Um, Minnesota is not a large sheep state. Uh, so, you know, our, we, we had cattle here and it was like, well, we got to try cattle because there's sheep are not everywhere. And I know in some places of the, the country, a lot of people are grazing in sheep, but we need to look at other livestock species as well to be able to, to include that. So our goal was to have solar, to graze under, and then um, you can see here, we have a 50 kW fast charger at our research station. So our solar panels would power the DC fast charger and we have an electric vehicle as well. So it's kind of a closed loop system so we can generate our energy to power cars 
and you know other people come by with their Teslas or other vehicles and, and can use that uh, charging station as well. When we put this in, we were the uh, one of the <clears throat> well, we were the only fast charger in Western Minnesota, but that's uh, changing now. So if you can, if you want to drive your electric vehicle out here, you're more than welcome to, and it, it's free to charge it. So because we're using our our own solar panels to do it. So this is our, our kind of our existing dairy. So what our goal was to um, sort of monitor our, our dairy unit and look at energy consumption, because how, how can we go to renewable energy if we don't really know what we're consuming from an electricity standpoint or, or other, you know, water, natural gas, all of that kind of stuff. So we have been monitoring our dairy farm here since 2013 for energy usage. And we use about 110,000 kilowatt hours per year on our dairy. So that's about 440 kilowatt hours per cow per year. So um, we, um, needed to figure out how much we have and, and we're a little bit less than some and I, we've we've monitored other dairy farms and i'll show you that in a second on what you might expect to see uh, we use about uh, 4500 therms of uh, natural gas per year and we use 220,000 gallons of hot water per year so about 900 gallons of hot water per cow per year so um, and that's really just in the dairy unit. So that's sort of what set the goal to sort of move into renewable energy aspects. And our, the goal of our dairy was to really become net zero. Um, we, are, we are not net zero yet, but that's our goal is to get to net zero. We're, we're getting close, we're getting close. But we, we started out with uh, figuring out our baseline energy audits of our dairy facilities to see what we all used, obviously. And then what we're getting into is developing and evaluating energy optimized systems. And one of those is solar. And we have lots of other ways. We have heat pumps and chillers and all kinds of stuff. Uh, we can give you the grand tour one day if, if you want to come out. So really, you know, we, we monitored all of our loads and, you know, milk harvest, cooling, water heating, cleaning, ventilation, lights, parlor heat. And then we uh, wanted to look at the entire process to see where we go and how we can uh, use that. So we have, you know, different heat pumps. So we can use heat from our milk, our parlor, our lagoon, from the earth for to offset some of these loads. But then can we use sunlight, wind, and storage? And those are all uh, emerging. And, and we're going to talk about solar today. So there's lots of different you know, renewable energy options, uh, solar thermal collectors, which we have at our dairy as well to preheat water. Uh, obviously, there's PV uh, that we'll talk about more in depth for electricity. Uh, there are small wind turbines for electricity. We have two 20 kW. Uh, small wind generators here. And um, then there's uh, many different things, in insulated tanks, uh, all of that kind of stuff. I'm going to jump in here, Brad, and just ask, are there any questions at this point from the, uh, from the assembled audience? Hearing none, please continue. Okay. Um, so throughout our process uh, was to sort of look at electrical consumption on Midwest dairy farms. And I have a few uh, slides through that. It was kind of a, a big project that uh, my uh, grad student, uh, Kirsten Sharp, who now uh, is a research scientist here at the research center, uh, this was her master's thesis. So we looked at a lot of dairy farms. We con conducted baseline energy. So if you ever want to know about collecting energy usage from specific loads, everything, lights, fans, heaters, you name it, this is how you do it. 
you take the, the utility panel and you hook up a bunch of sensors to it to measure all of that electrical load. Um, and lots of data uh, can be generated through that. So this is actually our, um, our, oops, uh, our dairy here for over a couple time periods uh, and how we generate that. So most of the energy comes from milk cooling. There's heaters in the wintertime. So this big red mark, that's space heaters. So uh, if you have a space heater on when you're cold, they use a lot of energy. So the $30 space heater is going to cost you a lot more than $30. So if you have a space heater, uh, probably should just turn it off. Uh, and so we have fans, uh, vacuum pumps, all kinds of stuff. So, you know, our, our dairy, it ebbs and flows based on cow numbers and time, but you can see we're around six to, you know, 10, 11,000 kilowatt hours per month on our dairy. We monitored a lot of other dairy farms too. We, we monitored uh, four other dairy farms that range uh, from 150 cows to eight, 9,000 cows. And you can see that, you know, the biggest thing is fans and heat and milk cooling. And this is sort of their monthly average. So, you know, we're, this is farm E, this is us. We're about 7,500 kilowatt hours. Uh, some other farms, you know, there, there's big ranges in kilowatt hours. And so we needed to get that baseline to figure out, uh, you know, yeah. how, how much solar we need or wind. Brad, was there any uh, difference per cow in the different herds significant? Uh, actually, not much. If you look at it from a cow basis, or a per uh, you know per pound of milk. Oh, yeah. There's not a lot of differences. Yeah, that's interesting. There's some slight differences, slight differences, but um, it's not. Uh, you know, it, it and it's it's sort of size neutral. You know, it doesn't matter on the size of the dairy. We, you know, um, so we're we're some. I, I should say a, a lot of it depends on what what farms have, whether they have, you know, uh, variable speed drives, you know, LED lights, all of that. So some farms didn't have LED lights, they were moving to LED. So there's a lot of different things on a dairy farm and it really depends on the load and every farm is different. That, that's one thing that we learned. So that sort of sets the, the tone we, where we were going. We needed to generate, figure out how much energy our dairy was using so we could figure out how to offset that really uh, you know that that's our goal to be net zero so we did that by some solar installations and here's uh, some of ours we'll talk about some specifics on each of these and and where we've done so um we first started with a 27 kilowatt array on the swine barn finish uh, the finishing barn and that's really the first project we had that had solar so we we started with swine and um, have moved uh, a lot more towards uh, the dairy end now but uh, we're working on it from a swine perspective as well to put some you know solar on on the barn roofs or you know it could be anything this could be a dairy barn or, or any type of barn or roof or house or whatever so we've we've done that too and are, are monitoring that but from the dairy perspective, this was uh, uh, with some grants, uh, we were able to put up this 50 kilowatt uh, array uh, in October of 2016. Um, it's uh, 10K solar, which is uh, not uh, in business anymore. So that solar company is uh, out of business, but that at the time that's what we had. So we've had this solar for a little over five years. Um, and you can see some of the specifications there. We have it up about uh, eight feet uh, off the ground and, uh, you know, just sunk the poles in the ground, no other infrastructure, uh, what, what might be. So we, um, and we'll utilize this uh, actual solar panel with some of the uh, research that we're doing, looking at, you know, can we grow different grass species, forbs, uh, you know, crops underneath solar panels and, and how well they perform. So that's, 
we'll, we'll utilize some of these solar installations for that. You can kind of get a bigger, uh, a little bit bigger, uh, you know, overview of what that 50K uh, solar system looks like. Uh, this brown uh, lane on the right hand side, that's our cow lane. So from pastures, we, our cows walk down the lane over to the milking facility, but um, uh, this is uh, one of the solar installations that we have. It's not in a pasture, so this is not, this was not put in a pasture, but we can utilize that. We've raised some dairy calves and stuff under it uh, in the past, but we'll be doing more with that one. Uh, we also have a, a 30 kW ground mount system. This is not in a pasture as well, so this is just kind of put out to, to, to look at, you know, different comparisons between solar systems and uh, we've had this one since uh, it came online in August of 2017. And you can see the power generation uh, by month and year for, for this solar. You know, obviously we get lots more solar uh, generation, solar energy in the summer months, June and July are the best. And um, obviously, you know, December is probably the worst when uh, the not very direct sunlight. Uh, quick question, Brad, are, are any of these panels adjustable? These are not adjustable. No, none of okay. these panels are, are adjustable. So they're kind of set at the best average position? Sort they of are, yes. Yes, they are set at that. Thank you. And a lot of this we're learning as we go. You know, we're trying, not, none of our solar uh, installations are the same. <clears throat> none of them no. are the same. They're all different. So we all learn every time we, we do no. something new. No, that's great. I got a question here, if you don't mind. Uh, sure from uh, Coke who says, uh, asks, uh, any estimated cost difference of ground mount posts versus cattle PV posts, eight feet? Uh, that's a good question. We can talk about that more. Really no cost difference, no cost difference. Uh, the one solar install that we're gonna talk about, our 30 kW system was about $86,000. So about $3 a watt. So the uh, going up, that's, uh, going up in height did not increase the cost at all. And that's probably the biggest, that's the, the number one question that we hear about this is what's the additional cost? And really there is none, there, there really is none. So um, we'll move into agrivoltaic. So that's sort of where we got next. So we had all these solar installations, they're just stationary. They're not being, you know, they're just generating solar energy. They're not being, used for any other thing. So, um, you know, we, we saw this, uh, you know, this ad or, you know, the Borden company, uh, you know, how can solar save uh, dairy farms in the U.S.? And so can we combine the use of solar PV and agriculture and, and move into that? So that was our, our goal was to uh, move into this agrivoltaics where we can graze cattle underneath solar panels and we'll be talking more about this one this is our 30 kW system uh, ground mounted and I have uh, quite a few pictures about it and this is where we did research with it uh, as well uh, we'll also talk about uh, this this is Kirsten uh, standing there proudly with uh, cows and heifers underneath this is another system that we'll talk about uh, that we have in our pasture, but you, you can see that uh, shade is the biggest reason for um, putting solar in pastures with, with cattle. Uh, if you want to know more about it, we give kind of an overview a little bit. We have a YouTube video on our uh, research center's website, so you can check that out if you want to know a little bit more about um, some of the research that we've done. I'll talk some about that, but if you want to get a, a good uh, YouTube view from there, uh, you can certainly check that out too. Can you, uh, would it be possible to post that link, Brad? Uh, yeah, we can. At some point, yeah, I can't can. copy yeah. it there. Yep, yeah. yep, yeah, we'll do that. Excellent, thank you. So this was, so it's, you know, I talk about a, a, our progression here and how this this solar, how we, we built that. So this is the pasture that we put it in. So this is, 
early spring of 2018. There is no solar installation there. So you can see there's, you know, cows on nice lush green grass. It's, uh, you know, still cloudy out. It's much better than 20 below zero like it is today. But um, if it's sunny, the cows are outside. They're not being shaded any way. So that was our goal was to put solar here. Some of it is uh, from an aesthetic standpoint as well. So it's just off our parking lot by our office building. So when you come into our parking lot, you can see the solar panels right there um, and the shade. So you don't have to walk a large distance to see solar in our, in our pasture. So we worked with uh, Zenergy, a Minnesota company uh, based out of Sabika, Minnesota to uh, install this uh, solar system in June of 2018. So this is, is what we did. Um, we, we put the poles in the ground. Maybe I have some other pictures. So we, we weren't really sure what cattle would do to the solar system. You know, it really hadn't been done a lot or if ever, you know, so, so will the cows mess with it? How will they bang on the poles? You know, we, we, we tried to think of everything um, a cow might do to destroy something. And so we sunk these poles in the ground with concrete. I don't know if it's maybe a little bit. So we have uh, concrete about a few feet down. I think it's three or four, maybe even six feet. I can't remember now, but um, it's way, way overdone. I'll tell you that. We, we went overboard based on what we've learned. So, uh, you know, we have large poles, um, and lots of concrete that maybe for us probably increase the cost, but we, you know, retrospectively, we probably didn't need to do that because what we've learned is the cattle really don't bother the solar panels at all and the poles and don't really rub against them or anything. So it's probably a little overkill um, for that. But these are sort of the pole mounts that we used. If you're curious, uh, you know, this is, so this is installation in July. These are the, you know, we use these multi-pole multi mounts uh, um, to install the, the solar. Uh, I think these were Helene panels uh, in our system. They're, <clears throat> I believe at about a 35 degree angle. And in July, 2018, there they are. There's the, the finished, uh, 30 kW, so it's in two banks, uh, 15 kW each, uh, to provide some shade. It's a little bit hard to see, but you, if you look at this first pole here, there's you can see some wires, and so there's a little conduit that's going down that pole, so the cattle don't bother the the wires or anything. They're the the wires are up higher, so we don't have cattle trying to eat wires or anything, and so we we had you know there's a little bit extra. To, to, to hide the wires and everything to so the cattle don't bother it. Um, but it worked out uh, well. This is kind of the backside. Uh, you can see here's the concrete, uh, the pole suck into the stuck uh, into the concrete here in the ground uh, with with the solar mount. A lot of the wires and stuff were you know kind of hidden behind a, some sort of the mount system here so uh, the cattle don't bother it at all. Well, Brad, we've got a question here, and this is probably getting a little ahead, but at some point uh, there was a question about what is the pasture grass and what works best for cattle at this site. I'm sure you're going to cover that. Sure. We'll, we'll talk a little bit about that, but this is, uh, there's uh, meadow fescue, uh, red clover, white clover, uh, some orchard grass. Uh, there's smooth brome grass, quack grass in this pasture. So you can see there, there was a little bit of damage to the pasture. Uh, here, you know, from all the trucks and, and uh, you know, skid loaders and everything that we had come in to do that, but not too bad. We'll kind of look at it from a perspective and I'll show you what, what might happen. So in end of July, we put the cows out there. Uh, this is um, 80, well, I think it was more like 90 milking cows that we put out there in July that summer just to kind of see what would happen, get used to it. Obviously you can notice they trample the grass a lot. Um, here the grass 
we, we didn't graze this pasture a lot that spring because, you know, we were doing the solar install. So the grass probably was a little bit taller and this is what they do to it. So they destroyed uh, the grass and the pasture and it kind of rained a little bit there. So, you know, no, it, it, it turned a lot to, to mud. And when you put 90 cows out there, this is uh, what might happen. But I will tell you, we did not do anything after that. We didn't reseed any grass. We just left it alone. And I'll show you pictures how it came back itself. So these are cows uh, kind of uh, hanging out and underneath the shade. So there is, uh, you know, it, it really depends on the sun and the angle of the sun and, you know, how the shade is cast for the cows. So these are the cows kind of standing in the shade uh, out of the, from the panels. And uh, later the, the grass grows back. You know, this is the, the from the, the dirt, this is the next spring. So we didn't do anything. Like I said, we just left it alone, pulled the cows off, let the grass come back itself. And uh, grass uh, does wonderful things with cattle and manure and urine and the grass comes back itself. So we didn't do anything. And this is uh, what it looks like the next year. So here you can see a little bit better picture on the the conduit going down the pipe with the wires coming from the solar panel over to the, uh, we, we actually have, I don't know if I have a picture here, but our inverters are outside of the pasture about, um, I don't know, 10, 12 feet away from this pole that is where we have the, the solar inverters. Uh, so the cows don't mess with those. So you have to have, you probably, you know, the solar invert, the inverters have to be outside of the pasture. Again, this is what it uh, you know looks like, and the nice green grass, and you know we we haven't planted anything else. We just allowed the grass to come back after this one. That was not our goal yet to figure out what grasses work for solar. Uh, but then during our research study, you can see lots of nice grass and the cows laying under the solar. Even uh, when it's cloudy out, they will lay underneath the solar panels uh, when. Um, you give them the chance to do that. So here they all are. Uh, of course, you always get one that doesn't want to lay underneath the, the shade, but most of them will lay underneath the, the solar uh, where the shade is cast. So, um, and these are stationary and we'll, we'll talk about some of the future stuff we're, we're thinking about. Uh, as There's we always an outlier, isn't there? Of course, <laughs> of course, there's always one. Nope. There's always a radical. <laughs> in the background, you can see our uh, small scale wind turbine, the 20 kW uh, wind, wind, uh, wind generation there in our pasture as well. Um, and this is, uh, you know, another picture, uh, 80 milking cows underneath the grass. Um, you know, they eat on the grass, stand underneath the solar uh, for, for shade. So I'm thinking, uh, assuming hotter, and summers, uh, that shade is, you know, this is a real climate adaptation. Did, any uh, thoughts or data on providing shade? And I mean, there's, and milk production and cow health. To... Uh, we have some of that. I'll, I'll, I'll show you okay. that. Okay, uh, yeah, excellent. We'll, we'll, we'll get to there. Excellent, yeah. And as we go, you know, just a few more pictures of how the grass is and the cows and the solar uh, shading and, and how you can do that. And we have lots of field days. Uh, if some of you are on here, you might see yourself in a picture, but uh, uh, we, we have lots of field days where we talk about solar shading and, and uh, how we, we go about doing that with our, our grass. So, if, you know, we'll probably have a field day this summer and into the summers and stuff uh, talking about that. Question always about what about winter? Well, here we are, uh, snow on the solar panels. Uh, this was after the first year um, and it still generates energy with there's snow on the panels. Um, I forget what temperature you know it, it gets to, it heats up the, the solar panels and it'll actually melt the snow off the panels, but you can get uh, snow on them. Uh, it doesn't get very deep. Uh, you know, the, the angle of these panels, the snow kind of just rolls off once it gets a little bit hotter out. So it uh, really doesn't affect the, the solar energy generation. 
And like I said, our goal was to have a, a fast charger and our, uh, we have a Chevy Bolt EV, 100% electric vehicle that we can power from our own solar energy that our cows graze under. That's uh, kind of the plan. So this is our, uh, go ahead. Carl. That's awesome. Yeah, no, that is, that is great. And I can imagine charging your tractor and whatever. Well, yeah, we'll get to there too. They're, they're oh, okay. <laughs> oh yeah, they're electric tractors. That, that we're, we're moving into that realm too. Uh, awesome. But this is our, um, if you want to take a peek, this is our, uh, you know, it's all, we can see the energy generation from this 30 kW in our, in our pasture. So this is what it looks like um, on a monthly basis. So our lifetime energy since we uh, installed it in, well, you know, we had a little generation in uh, 2018, and or we started in July of 2018. We've our lifetime energy is about 132 megawatts of energy over the last four and a half years. So you can see there's some generation here. We had some missing data. Our inter, uh, internet got fried one day, so we have a, a little bit of missing stuff. But uh, this is our uh, and then the right is is solar production. Uh, just this month so far, you know, we've generated about one megawatt of energy. You can see, depending on the days, uh, you know, first part of January, not so much, and it kind of ebbs and flows based on, you know, cloudiness and and blizzards and every other thing that happens out here. So we. Um, we have that 30 kW system and the University of Minnesota Morris came to us at the research center and they wanted to put up a, a solar array as well and utilize it in our pastures. So this is the University of Minnesota Morris's 240 kilowatt array. So it's in kind of four banks and we can utilize that uh, as shade for our cows as well. And this just came online this year. Um, so it's relatively new and it sits out on the state highway. So when you drive through Morris on the state highway, you can see this huge solar array and cattle grazing under it. So this is kind of a picture from there, these four banks, and uh, we certainly don't have enough cattle to cover it all, but you can see how the uh, array casts a bunch of shade there for the cows uh, to utilize from that perspective. So there, uh, this I believe is about a hundred uh, animals out here in the grass, and you can see that these uh, the mounts for the panels are a little bit different here, and they're not necessarily sunk into the ground and concreted everything like uh, we we did a little overkill there. But um, again, these are uh, eight ten feet high and uh, work well for, for all of our, our cattle. Again, they're stationary, they're not, not movable or anything. And you can see how well the grass uh, is growing underneath the panels uh, without minimal disturbance. We, we didn't, like I said, we didn't replant anything, no grass species here yet. Uh, what we did, we just let it come back naturally after, after the install. Uh, more, you know, grazing grass under there and they hang out in the nice sunshine and, and they like to, uh, you know, be under the, the shade uh, when it gets hot in the summertime and they, uh, that's, that was the purpose of that uh, was to, to see what happens uh, there. And I took this this morning. This is what it looks like if you drive by on the state highway, you can see this huge solar array, 204 banks, um, 240 kW. So we can uh, if you ever want to see a larger solar array and, and cattle grazing, uh, that is the place to see it. So a little bit about the research that we did. So, you know, that, that's obviously our goal is, is to do research on these type things. And so we have um, uh, Kirsten, this was her uh, part of her master's thesis. So she published in the Journal of Dairy Science on kind of the first study on utilizing solar PV systems to shade cows. And uh, if you want to, you know, you're, the, it's a free paper online. So if you want to read a little more about the research, but I'll, I'll talk about some of the, the things that we do. So we did it in 2019. Um, we, we 
utilized uh, almost 30 cows. Uh, we had different groups. So we had cows that were uh, could be shaded with the solar system. And then we had cows that didn't have access to any shade. So they were out underneath the, uh, you know, underneath the sunlight and were, were happening. So we did this during four times. So we, these are our, our grazing days that we used for this study. So that was the, you know, we, the cows were only under there during these times. So obviously we had to give the pasture a rest. So the cows did not have access to the solar for the whole summer. It was about uh, 20, what a 28 days, 21, 28 days that they only had access across the whole, you know, 120 day grazing period. So a small, small time period. So we used our, our solar system was to really see if there was any benefit to having shade from uh, our solar PV uh, for, for cattle. And this is, uh, uh, you can see Kirsten and a few other interns. So it, it gives you a, a good idea, you know, undergraduate research projects uh, can, can happen in this way too. Uh, so they were out collecting information on cows, looking at behavior and utilizing the shade, everything uh, from those aspects as well. Uh, I guess we see us, so we used, uh, you know, this solar panel uh, system. Um, in our, our 30 kW. So this is our, our weather. So these uh, it's in, I guess, uh, Celsius, but you kind of get the idea. Uh, mean temperature, you know, we had some days that were uh, high and low even during the first period. So we had really some really hot days in June. It was 34 degrees C. So that's uh, um, in, the, in the 90s. Uh, so we're, we're getting hot and humid uh, at, at certain time periods, you know, some in July and August and September, you can see uh, our humidity was 86, uh, so it was really high. We also used, uh, you know, here's the, the precip, so we had some rains, uh, not so much rain in July, we had lots of rain in August and September, so it was kind of a rainy period a little bit. Um, THI is a temperature humidity index. So it gives you a good idea on heat stress of cows. And heat stress, you know, typically they say occurs at 68 for a cow that can induce heat stress. So you can see, you know, during this time period, we should have had, you know, at 68 in July and August, not maybe getting there and uh, that these cows were probably under some sort of heat stress. Oops, uh, so we, we, we did all kinds of stuff with these cows. We looked at fly numbers. We looked at behaviors. We counted uh, respiration rates. So how the cow breathes, whether they were under the shade or not. Uh, we looked at milk production, uh, lots of different aspects uh, during this time period. We also had sensors on these cows. So we can use precision technology to look at line behavior, uh, activity levels. We had uh, these SMAX tech boluses. They recorded internal body temperature. So we could get an idea of how stressed the cow was by looking at their internal temperature. So these are some of the results that we saw. Uh, so we looked at fly counts and respiration. We didn't really see any difference in fly numbers. So the, the goal is, you know, do our, our cows underneath shade, do they have less flies because flies bother pasture-based animals? We didn't really see any difference there, whether it was morning or evening, um, whether they, they had more flies or not. However, if you look at it from a respiration rate, uh, you know, breathing of a cow, there was no difference in the morning. So, you know, mornings typically are cooler, I think we were doing these respiration rates uh, about nine o'clock between nine and 10 in the morning. So, you know, when it's cooler out, uh, it's not really any difference whether they had shade or not. However, in the afternoon, when it heats up in Minnesota and gets humid, now we see that the cows that had no shade had more breaths per minute. So they were 
more heat stressed. They, you know, were breathing heavier and harder. And um, so the shade from the solar panels actually helped reduce some indication of heat stress. Uh, Brad? Yep. Uh, Fritz was wondering if you could tell us a little bit more about cow body temperature and the range of comfort for those of us that aren't familiar with, with those things. Sure. Cow, average cow body temperature is about 101 and a half uh, Fahrenheit. And, uh, <clears throat> you know, it, it can range. It, there's not a large range, you know, between 100 and 102 or 100 and a half and 102 is sort of normal variation. So outside of that is when you start to see lots of lots of problems. And, and how does that relate to outside temperature and and what you're finding in terms of being in the sun or shade or not? Uh, well, I'll, I'll show you some internal temperatures here in, in a second. Uh, we looked at hygiene of, of these cows. So if they had shade, they were probably were a little bit dirtier on their uh, bellies and maybe their lower legs. And we attribute that to, you know, standing underneath the solar panels and maybe creating a little mud hole or something like that, that the cows were doing. So uh, biologically, it probably is not a big difference uh, whether they were a little slightly dirtier or not, but it's a consideration to think about if you get a whole bunch of animals, like I showed in some of those pictures, they can destroy it really fast if, if you want. Um, milk production, you know, it, th there is no statistical difference here. The numbers are not really meaningful at all. You know, it's, it's hard to tell from a production standpoint because these cows were only underneath the solar panels for, you know, 28 days out of the whole summertime. And this is milk production during that time. So, you know, yeah, numerically you see a little bit less for cows in the shade, but was that because they were standing underneath the shade and they weren't out grazing or drinking water because they were trying to get away from the sunlight. So it's, we, we can't really hang our hat on the production numbers. And that's where we get into trying to look at long-term effects with uh, solar and uh, what, what we're going to be moving into. So uh, Brad, here's another question from Sarah Lloyd, the dairy farmer. <laughs> she says, sorry, if I missed this, maybe we could drill down on this question a little more. Do you have info on how much the shade of the panels reduces the high temperatures? Uh, is there a known tipping point of high temperatures that reduces milk production? Uh, well, milk production can be reduced in, in, in cattle at, you know, it's not necessarily the temperature does it, it's the temperature and humidity. I, I would argue that the humidity is a bigger cause of heat stress in, in cattle. And like I said, you, you can start getting heat stress in cows at 70 to 75 degree air temperature if you have the humidity right you know we'll we'll see that in our cows here at morris when it's 75 degrees out you can see breathing uh, increase uh, definitely uh, they're they're stressed um, in if you don't have access to shade so um you know so indeed at, it's at, not at the, low heat, temperature. It's the humidity as it's, we say it's, right. it's the humidity <laughs> is the big factor obviously if it's 95 degrees and there's no humidity well it's still it's it's hot too so um, it's it, it's kind of a combination of both now this is kind of an activity level of those cows uh, the um, you'll note in in yellow is the no shade cows so they're just more active probably trying to figure out how to you know drink more water they're looking for places to uh, get out of the the sunlight, which they didn't have any, uh, they, they can't get out of, there, there's no shade allowed for those cows. So there was just more activity, breathing heavier, you name it. And you see a lot of that in, from, you know, 11 o'clock in the morning till late at night, they just have, a, they're just more active. Uh, not much difference in activity overnight when, when it's cooler, but these cows are starting to, to have wrong uh, issues. So. So, uh, and there's another question from Sarah wondering if sprinklers or misters are uh, considered or is that thought about uh, under the panels? I've thought about that, putting yeah. some sort of, um, I've, I've thought about that. Um, certainly one thing that we might explore into the future, 
I think it all depends on how much water you miss them with. Uh, you know, the cows, if you miss them, the cows are gonna stay, stay underneath the solar panels. It'll probably help reduce the heat stress on the cows, but what is it gonna do to the grass and the dirt and everything and the mud holes underneath the solar panels? So that's what yeah. I think of more from that yeah. type of aspect. Uh, but if you look at uh, internal body temperatures, so these are our temperatures of, of cows, um, really no, there's no difference uh, uh, from midnight to well, noon really uh, in, in body, internal body temperature. But if you start looking at the daylight hours, now you see uh, some differences. So um, the cows that are uh, have no shade are about a half a degree Fahrenheit greater in internal body temperature. So, you know, we, we, a half a degree might not seem like a lot, but uh, when we talk about the bigger picture of climate change, you know, a half a degree means, uh, you know, civilization may disappear. So, uh, you know, a half a degree is, is a big change for internal cows. It, it numerically, it might not think we, we might not think that a half a degree is, is not much, but it is from a cow perspective. That is a big change. So between the daylight, it's really in the day. Heat stress obviously is occurring in the day. At night, there's not much. So about a half a degree more Fahrenheit uh, from a heat stress perspective. And we'll see, I don't have a graph of that, but sometimes you will see, this is an average Sometimes there are cows that, that have uh, 104, 105 internal body temperature, and they are stressed. Um, uh, so if you look at it from a, across a daylight hour, the cows on yellow are the top line. Those are the cows that did not have shade, and the black line is the cows that had shade. So you notice that uh, during the overnight hours, early morning hours, body temperature is not really a big deal. They're about the same. But when it gets hot out and humid in the afternoon hours into the evening, that's where we see the biggest difference. And this is in, you know, uh, this is in, in Celsius, but you see uh, at some point there's almost a half a degree a Celsius difference in internal body temperature. There's this little spike for the cows at um, the no shade cows about six o'clock uh, and that's milking time. So, you know, bringing cows from pasture to um, the milking parlor obviously increases uh, internal temperature. And it, for, the, for the no shade cows, well, it doesn't inc really increase them much at all. They're, they're just hot the whole day, but we see some increase, but those cows, uh, once they go back to the pasture and can get underneath the shade again at, you know, eight o'clock at night, they're, they're back down, their temperature is back down again. Whereas the other cows that don't have access to shade, that temperature is maintained throughout the whole evening hours and really only starts to come back down about midnight. So, you know, long after we're all sleeping, those cows are still heat stressed. And uh, Brad, there was a question about how did you measure body temp at different times of the day? Wasn't that that little implant you showed earlier? Uh, yeah, so this is a sensor that goes in the kind of rumen reticulum uh, in, in the <laughs> stomach. So in, in the um, stomach compartments of the cow, and it takes a measurement uh, every minute of the day. Wow. So we know, you know, every minute we can see and we can see drinking behavior. So when a cow goes to uh, uh, the water trough, the, the temperature goes down quite a bit, and then it comes back up. So it's all uh, this is all internal temperature measured at um, one minute intervals. Amazing. That's a uh, wonder what uh, technology can do uh, these days to, to watch stuff. So this is kind of what we found and I'll, I'll have a few slides left that will go into what where we're going in the future here. So obviously our, our cows that were shaded uh, had lower respiration rates and lower body temperatures during the hottest times of the year. Uh, so that was our goal. So shade actually reduced heat stress. So in, in this study, even though we, we did it for a, a short period of time, and we're really going to start moving into many different aspects related to that. And, 
you know, you have summertime and what, what happens in the wintertime and can we utilize those for, for different aspects? A uh, shameless plug for uh, our, our University of Minnesota podcast. If you want to learn more, uh, the episode 11, this is Kirsten talking about the, her research for 30 minutes. And we also had Joe Lawrence from Cornell University talk about solar energy and land use uh, on our podcast. So if you want to learn more from a more in-depth perspective, feel free to, to listen to those as well. So th this is sort of where we're moving next. Um, we, we, we have, you know, the research, the cows underneath the solar, but we're starting to move into integrating solar and livestock and cropping systems. So this is a, a nice graphic from some German outfits. So we can, you know, have solar panels, we can have cows under them, we can grow crops under them, we can drive tractors under them, and it sort of fits everything. We can use the solar to power the barns uh, and other aspects and maybe the town. So that's sort of where we're going into the future. And we, we did receive a, a grant last year again from um, Environmental Natural Resource Trust Fund here in, in Minnesota to look at more uh, PV solar systems in our pastures and fields. And we're gonna be looking at tracking systems to optimize solar energy potential. And can we're, we're also exploring, can we develop a solar system that's portable for cows and pasture? So we can use the energy either from a battery storage perspective. We're thinking about electric tractors. Can we power an electric tractor from that solar? So, you know, generate energy to, to power tractors, use it for irrigation. We can also shade cows. So that's kind of what we're going to start developing this summer and evaluating some of that. Obviously, we're also going to look at those solar systems from an agronomic condition. You know, we're going to be looking at different grass species, um, what grows best underneath the solar. We're also going to plant corn and soybeans and wheat and what crops can, you know, uh, some people will know me as I do not like solar systems on good arable land. I think it's a, a waste of good land to put solar systems on that are on the ground and just let weeds grow. Why can't we raise those panels 10, 12, 14 feet in the air and run a combine underneath them and grow corn? So can we grow corn and generate energy? And they're exploring that in Europe now, uh, but we're going to, you know, can we grow crops underneath those solar systems and what does it do? And then obviously look at long-term production effects of, of shade, you know, <clears> like <throat> we only used uh, three weeks or four weeks of time for shade for our cows, but what happens if we can utilize those for the whole year? Um, and can we use the, the shade potential as a windbreak in the winter time for our cattle and how we can design that solar system to do that? And obviously there'll be lots of educational stuff uh, to do that if you want. So yeah, more, more plugs. So we're having a, a farm energy conference uh, this summer here in Morris uh, in June where we have different aspects where we can talk about agrivoltaics and solar energy and green ammonia, and uh, we'll have some tours and all kinds of stuff. So be watching for more information there, but that'll be in person here in Morris uh, those two days. And always, so, uh, you know, all of these projects would not be possible without funding from uh, Minnesota Environmental and Natural Resources Trust Fund. So. Uh, uh, we thank them for our, their gracious support of our program to be able to really look at this stuff because we're, we're really at the forefront of, of looking at solar energy and, and grazing and livestock and, and how we're going to do that. So we're definitely gracious uh, to that. So with that, I'd uh, be happy to answer any yeah, questions. Yeah. If you need more info there, there you go. You can check us out and uh, we'll go from there. Oh, Brad, that is fantastic. I'm, I'm really fired up. Um, I, one thing that comes to mind was, uh, as I mentioned, working with grazers back in the 90s uh, and really trying to keep cattle outside as much as possible. They're not 
close them up in barns where they get sick. Um, and, and when you mentioned the winter shelter belt thing, uh, but then charging up your tractor and growing crops. Uh, I just think this is super cool. And uh, let's see, I think I got a question here. Um, uh, Francesca wants to know, what was the installation cost difference between the 240 kilowatt system and the 30 kilowatt system in terms of dollars per watt? Uh, I'm not entirely sure what <laughs> okay. the total cost was on the 240, but I, I think it was, it was pretty similar. That The cost maybe was a little bit more per watt on the 240 system uh, yeah. than, than our 30 kW, but not a, a, a large uh, increase <clears throat> in cost. Okay, and then Fritz is wondering, have your, how are your systems insured? Well, I don't know. That... <laughs> <laughs> You have to ask somebody at the university system. Ask huh? somebody at the university. If the hail happens, I don't know. We probably just turn them off. I guess I don't. I'm the, the university. That that's uh, that's way above my pay grade, Fritz. <laughs> Sorry about that, Fritz. But, but it is a question. It is it is something for for farmers to yep. think about? Uh, you know, ensuring this because if you get a hailstorm or or something, you know. We could drive a hurricane through it, and ours probably aren't going to come off. At least the poles are going to be there. Uh, the yeah. panels might come off, but that's something to think about. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, you want to ensure this. If you spend a lot of money, you know, our thirty kW was, you know, close to one hundred thousand dollars, and so you want to have some sort of insurance to, if if some natural disaster were were to happen. So, if anybody wants to chime Same. in, just unmute and uh, chime in, please. Yeah. Brad, uh, this is uh, James Durabi with Solar Farm. Um, really excited about, you know, being able to use the land and having solar at the same time. Um, the one thing that the message that I hear is there's no cost difference. And I, I do believe, I mean, mm -hmm. at a 240 kW size, you know, you're, you're getting a larger size system where you can bring equipment in and then, um, and then smaller size, it's, I don't think the sample size might be large enough because um, to say that the there'd be no cost difference, although in the one you bid out, it probably is that case, but you're kind of a highlighted uh, area where people know that if they get a system with you, you know, it's gonna be advertised. So it might not be quite mm -hmm. fair, but just, just from a practical maybe, standpoint. Maybe, I don't, I don't know about that, but maybe. Okay. But the post, the post are you know five to seven feet longer per, per post, and then uh, they're higher in the air. So, so you have a material cost. Um, you have the foundation has to be either pile driven and deeper, or or uh, the concrete deeper to because of the wind uplift. The higher up you are, um, the the more important thing is the labor. If you're on the ground and you can do the typical. Uh, two row panels, you, you can do that all from the ground, no equipment. So on a smaller systems, you know, the 20, 30, 40 K, I'll call those the smaller systems, you know, you don't have to bring equipment in. And then the long-term maintenance, if there's a, let's say you have a power level electronics, let's say a power optimizer, a microinverter, or even a panel that would go bad, you know, you know, the speed of doing something on the ground is quicker. So I just, I'm not, I'm not saying it's not going to be valuable because I would, I want my cake and eat it too. But to say that there's no cost difference, um, I think might be too premature. And I think, you may, and, um, and, and we'll have to find really efficient ways to do this, but it's not, you know, the standard uh, ground mounts that are pre-engineered are, you know, 11 feet tall and three feet off the ground and, and, and they don't, they already pre-engineered. So then you have to have an engineering study for the terrain and, and where you're at and for a smaller system that, that gets to be cost prohibitive. So I, I'm just, that was my comment as a solar installer and maybe I'm gonna be the wrong one, but I just, I, you got a big audience out there and I just wanted to make sure that that's not for sure fact that it's no cost difference. Well, I, yeah, I appreciate your comments, and I think that yeah, it it, it depends. There's many different factors that go into the the design and everything like that. But I think that you know that that is the the, the big factor. That's the number one question, and I think sometimes people blow it a little bit out of proportion to say, oh well, it's going to be 
X amount and you should just put it on the ground. You know, there, there's lots of advantages as well uh, to putting it up higher and whether there's a cost difference or not, I, I think that's certainly debatable in many different aspects. So um, that's really interesting. You know, it, again, I start out by talking about mimicking nature and multiple net benefits and and the cost for doing some of these things probably will be more or somewhat more, but maybe not as much as we think. But, uh, and I really appreciate the solar installers perspective, but there was benefits to the dairy farm or the beef farm right. that, that uh, weigh it. So we have to think in terms of, and the solar installer isn't necessarily thinking of a uh, milk yield or something, but uh, right. And and also that you know, there's no land lease here. You know, sometimes those right. systems are paying farmers for the land right. and stuff that we we don't get any of that. So there's no you know these are these are plopped down on our land and that that's it. Was no payments from anybody to put these solar installations here. You know, and and that you know there there's other aspects outside of all of this that that we don't. Uh, utilize or think of or anything like that. So here in Michigan, we're just getting started in this whole solar thing and grazing and dealing with the power companies, they're afraid that they want to put the bottom edge 18 inches off the ground and they're afraid that sheep are going to put their feet on these and break them. And yet you're saying that cows are doing nothing to these. So I think it's some education needs to be done here somehow, some way to get in. The university is on the verge of putting one in that's taking up a bunch of sheep and beef pasture. And again, they're going to put it low to the ground. So the only thing we can graze under it is sheep and, and no beef cattle. And, and I just think something needs to happen. I don't know what. No, I, I agree. And, and there needs to be a lot of education related to that. And, you know, but obviously, you know, pictures don't do it justice here to, to show you what it looks like with, with cattle underneath that, but they don't really haven't bothered the panels at all. There's no damage. You know, some of our ground mount systems, I don't know, maybe I should fence it off and put some cattle around it and see what happens once. Uh, but I, I just don't think that sheep are going to want to climb on a bunch of solar panels, knowing behavior of animals and stuff. I, I, I've, obviously, we have to think about that and think about aspects. And that's one of the things that we did was, you know, can a cow destroy a solar system? And um, from what we've seen, it just doesn't happen. And, you know, I, there are a lot of other uh, installations where people are grazing sheep um, under <laughs> solar panels in the Northeast and uh, here in, in Minnesota. And I just, they're, they're not damaging the panels. It's, it's Well, and the other thing that goes along with that here in Michigan is we have a huge deer population. And right. don't tell me that they're fen these fences are keeping the deer out of there and are the deer jumping on them and breaking them? I, I don't know. Yeah, who, who knows what, what might happen there either. And we, we have lots of deer running around uh, our research center too. And, you know, some of these, the, some of the ground mount system, the ground mount system that we have, you know, a deer could walk right up to it and jump on it if it wanted to it's not fenced or anything so it's a pretty slippery surface right and we, uh, we alex issue. alex here from vermont is saying uh, uh higher off the ground will probably cost more but also shed snow better 18 off 18 inches off the ground he says at the bottom edge is too low to shed snow yeah that's upper midwest or new england yeah you're going to get snow piling at the bottom of the array i can understand oh, why is. they do it it's very simple you get it 18 inches off the ground, that means your whole structure costs less because of wind loading. And so what the utilities are doing and the solar developers are doing is they're saying, we don't need that winter output. We're all about summer output. That's when we need the energy. We're gonna go ahead and tilt that panel at 20, 25 degrees. We're gonna not put it very high off the ground and anything we lose in winter, it's okay. It's not worth worrying about in terms of extra cost up front or for that matter, clearing the snow. In Vermont's 30 inches off the ground standard and that's you know southern Vermont northern Vermont and even 30 inches off the ground we're going to get pretty soon here this next storm we're going to get snow piling up at the bottom which then keeps the snow from sliding off that's okay they just take that that's just part of the deal in terms of the whole overall operational cost and capital cost but that's what we see here 30 inches and even that doesn't shed the snow that's okay 30 inches is more than enough for sheep so we're happy with that 
Yeah, that is interesting uh, from a winter perspective. And, you know, I guess I've never thought about that and, and <clears> how <throat> low it is in snow shedding and stuff. So, yeah, there is some, like I said, we don't have all of the answers here either. And there's lots of different aspects related to Western Minnesota, to Michigan, to Vermont, uh, that, that everybody needs to take into consideration. And I think, you know, what we're trying to do here is show that there are many different ways and it's, you know, I'm a cattle guy, so I don't work with <laughs> sheep. So that's where my philosophy came from was I don't have sheep at this research center. So can I utilize cattle? And we're, we are getting some, uh, you know, large cattle ranchers that I've talked with from Texas to Nebraska talking about, can we put cattle underneath these huge solar installations? So there are, are plenty of ranchers thinking about this yeah. as well. And not uh, just a small little dairy like, no. like us. We're talking lots of cattle. Robert uh, chimes in and says, uh, enough experience now in other states to know that sheep do not damage solar arrays. Um, and and uh, aren't they covered with a, not a plexiglass, but what's that hard plastic? Uh, years ago, uh, working with a dairy farmer, they put in a new pit and it was lined with this plastic stuff and the angle on the sides are about the same as these panels. A deer and a dog fell down in there and they couldn't get out and they chased each other around until they were tired out. <laughs> but anyway, uh, uh, Bruce uh, uh, says, uh, the jury is out until we see the added benefits of your corn wheat experiments. Also, a host of potential benefits to offset added costs of the higher panels. And uh, Peter, go ahead. Thanks, Carl. Um, thanks for putting this together. Brad, I know we've spoken a couple of times on this as well. I was just curious from this group's perspective, has there been any discussion on um, incentives to do this kind of work? And I, Internally, for me, I struggle getting our operations team on board. I know you can point to research, but and until we can get kind of a dollars and cents element to get developers to try this, uh, you know, in, in a way that's not a, a, a maybe a financial risk to them, it's a little bit harder sell. I was curious, is there anything from SFA or from the University of Minnesota where they're, they're taking this research and taking the next policy step to say, hey, um, you know, state of Minnesota will give you a, whatever, a, a two cent per kilowatt hour increase in your revenue contracts to to do this uh, again I, i'm not saying it has to be a long-term solution but just trying to figure out how to get developers in the door um you know me personally I, I love the idea of bringing cattle but i need to be able to pitch it in a way that um that, that makes it cost neutral at, at, at you know at minimum knowing that we're going to have extra labor costs extra insurance costs whatever else um just trying to figure out what what's the next step from this research into into policy action and Peter, what's your uh, involvement in this realm? Oh, sorry. I, I work for U.S. Solar. Um, we've done, we, we have our first sheep project here in Minnesota now. Um, our landowner happened to be a sheep farmer, which worked out really well. And we've been doing pollinator-friendly habitat for years. Um, so I, I'm always looking to pitch whatever the next um, you know, agrivoltaic innovation is and, and just trying to find a way to, again, getting sheep on was a little bit easier because we, we had a landowner who had sheep already and it was a kind of a nice pilot. But how do, how do you make it more of a standard operating procedure um, as opposed to a one-off? And, and part of that is some kind of policy incentive to, to do so. And, and I see the link in the chat to Massachusetts. I know they're doing kind of that, that same policy, but I, I haven't seen that here yet in, in Minnesota. Uh, fr Fritz, may you, might you know uh, if there's anything like that? I, I don't, I haven't heard anything, but um, I, I don't know if there's anything happening or talks about that. No, but it'd be a great, a great discussion to have with the legislature. <laughs> um, I think you brought support. One of the questions I had was about, yeah, I, I certainly agree with Brad about not using um, farmland, but I also know that feedlots and dairies tend to be load centers. Um, and I was wondering if there's any kind of analysis, just even at a high level about, uh, you know, pairing solar and cattle shade at those, at those feedlots. Um, because that electrical infrastructure should be there. Yeah, it's just going off the solar. Yeah, we, you know, I'd have to go back and revisit that. We had a, a student uh, here from uh, Munster and Germany uh, look at one of our dairy farms here, N not our research center, but kind of look at the loads and, and kind of start pairing that with solar and actually wind generation and see what, what can be utilized on farms. And that's kind of the next step 
I think where we can look at, you know, even, you know, take out the grazing perspective and there's lots of opportunities there for solar too. Alex, uh, did you have a comment? You had your hand raised. <clears throat> As we uh, ponder all this is very fascinating. Um, if, if you wanna stay connected to anybody in this call, please post your phone or email on the chat there so people can get a hold of you. Um, so yeah, uh, I, I think Brad, this is incredible work you're doing. Um, any kind of general ideas on how much, uh, you know, there's so many variables, but say you're a grass-based dairy farmer and uh, how much could solar panels spread out like that offset your total energy uh, consumption? I mean, ballpark. <laughs> Well, I, I think obviously, I, I think it can offset a, a, a portion of your energy use. Obviously, what what we have, we have 200 and some KWs here, and it doesn't offset a, a small portion of ours, but we have pigs and a whole bunch of other aspects around it. But I think it, it has to be large enough to be able to offset that. And, you know, there's benefits. Uh, tax benefits, those things too, that, that farmers may take advantage of that we don't have. But I think that we're, we're at the cusp of that issue, trying to figure out how much yeah. does it offset. And, you know, we've done some modeling on larger farms and, you know, that, then we start getting into, you know, like here in my picture, wind, wind generation. So um, it just depends yeah. on the energy load of the farm and Without yeah, yeah. that, you'll have no idea on what to do. Yeah. So interesting. So interesting. Um, <clears throat> yeah. Yeah. Put in your uh, contact there if anybody wants. So go ahead, Alex. Yeah. I just, if we think about, grazing sheep in solar arrays as the entry drug. How much are you okay. seeing of that in the upper Midwest, right? I mean, this is gonna, that certainly lights the, you know, gives people the inspiration to think about doing more under these solar sites. And, you know, there's all this talk about Brad Komenek and the Colorado Agrivoltaic Center and, you know, you know, growing collards and all the rest of it. That's fine. It's, the entry point though is sheep. So are you seeing a lot of that? Because once you have that base, then it starts to be, there starts to be more awareness and openness. Are you seeing a lot of that in Minnesota, upper Midwest, Michigan, Wisconsin? I haven't heard anything about this type of thing happening in Wisconsin where I lived for 20 years, uh, any kind of grazing under solar. Yeah, no, I, I wouldn't say a lot. We're not a huge sheep, sheep state nice. or area, um, but it's starting to happen. And uh, some younger folks that are looking to, uh, you know, get into livestock and uh, look for multiple income sources. I, I posted earlier, we had a, if you go to the SFA Ecological Service Livestock Network <laughs> webpage, uh, last December, a month or go, so or ago, we had uh, Cannon River, Cannon Valley Grazers talk about their work under solar panels. Um, I think, you know, we're gonna look back, this is, this is the ground level start of all this kind of thing. And I think it's, uh, if we just keep going, I know, uh, you mentioned the sheep being the gateway species. Uh, that's exactly how we think of goats for uh, restoring savanna and, and, and whacking our buckthorn. It's, uh, it's our gateway animal. And, and once we can get things opened up and we can get sheep in there and cattle in there and maybe pigs and all kinds of interesting things. But, you know, we've got thousands and thousands of acres here in the Twin Cities Metro that are basically degraded sick woods that that why not produce some meat and milk and wool and whatever off of it. But I think, uh, I think you're onto something there. Let's see, you got another chat. Yeah, I, I think that, you know, the, and that's the reason why I thought about it from a cattle perspective is, you know, Minnesota is not a large sheep state. There are some with some producers that are grazing with sheep, but that's, you know, nobody's going to put up a solar and, and get a bunch of sheep to do it unless you already have sheep. So there's a lot of cattle in Minnesota, dairy and beef. And uh, so that's where our perspective was to start thinking about what um, other animals and livestock can we use besides sheep? Because 
this is sheep are, are, are a small uh, entity in, in Minnesota. And Fritz and makes and a good especially point. Especially in the upper that, Midwest. Uh, in the upper Midwest. Yeah, Fritz makes a good point too that sheep and goats we struggle and and as you know I think people are working on this but marketing outlets uh, for uh, smaller producers uh, in this era of massive consolidation of the meat industry. Uh, so these things have to kind of go in tandem. But uh, I think that's one thing, of course, COVID pointed out is when uh, the big boys had problems uh, in their meat packing plants, people turned to local producers and they just don't have the slaughtering and processing uh, facilities and there's some work there's a lot of work towards that but uh, that's a great point well as we start to wrap up here any other questions or thoughts so and again here in michigan we don't have enough sheep to even meet the demand that, that they're talking about there's not enough big flocks to put under a, any size solar no. array at all and no. i mean as far as the marketing we have great marketing and slaughter plants for sheep for sheep here lambs fat lambs here in michigan that, that's not a problem but um there's just not enough sheep. So I don't know how we're gonna meet the demand. And as far as goats, my own experience with goats at home, I have a commercial goat dairy is they'll chew through metal conduit and eat the wires off your automatic waters if you don't <laughs> watch right. them, so. As a uh, wise farmer once said, cats and goats spend a little bit of every day with the devil. <laughs> but uh, it's an, another one of these chicken and egg things, isn't it, with a lot of these issues, uh, I find. Good to hear you've got some facilities though. There's a slaughterhouse in downtown Detroit that butchers, slaughters goats or sheep every day. And they're Sweet. looking for, there's a great market here in Michigan for it. So well, hopefully if uh, plans go to fruition, we'll have more of that here in Minnesota and Wisconsin. Um, well, I don't wanna keep anybody later. We can keep going if you're talking. Uh, um, Brad, did you want to just, uh, uh, unless there's, if there's any other burning questions, Brad, did you want to get the last word in there? And, and uh, again, uh, any plans uh, what, what, for 2022? Well, if, if, you know, like I said, we're going to move into the uh, system here where we're going to plant forages and crops and move into longer term uh, uh, solar grazing and tracking systems. So, you know, I'd be happy to visit with anybody and, you know, come out and visit or talk with more people. And, you know, we're, we're really interested in, in all of these aspects. And if you have any ideas on, on what we might see or want to do, you know, drop me a note and, and we can figure something out. Um, we're, we're more than willing to work with a lot of people to figure out these aspects because I think it's only going to keep growing. You know, solar is, is not going away and uh, it, it's only gonna get larger. So uh, we're here to try and help answer uh, questions. We don't have all the answers, and, but uh, we'll, we'll work with you and try and figure something out. So thanks for, uh, thanks for listening today. And if you get a chance, uh, come out and visit us. Yeah, Bobby says exciting research, uh, great presentation. According to be available, yes, it's gonna be recorded. It is being recorded as we speak, and it'll be on the Sustainable Farming Association Web page. If you go to chapters, it's the Ecological Service Livestock Network uh, sub web page. Well, thanks, Brad. Uh, I had known about your work, but not in this detail, and it's really exciting. And I think uh, we're headed towards the future, and this is great. Thank you so much. And uh, again, it'll be posted, and uh, let's just keep the conversation going. Um, I'm always looking for ideas and topics, and, and I think, uh, again, returning livestock to land or keeping them there in the first place, and then uh, mimicking nature with uh, grass-based systems and, uh, and including, you know, restoring habitat and all of that. So thank you all for joining us. Thanks, everyone. Brad, and, and Brad's presentation, for those of you that missed, uh, is, uh, is again available at that Sustainable Farming Association website if you go to ecological service livestock and the past presentations. The PDF is there and that's where the recording will be posted. Well, stay warm, uh, enjoy the weather. There's, there's no bad weather, just bad clothing. <laughs> Thanks a million everybody. Yep. Thank you so Thank you. much. This has been really great. Take care now. Yep.